Well, here we are now. We've got uh, part two of the big picture. <laughs> we'll see uh, if this uh, makes any sense when I'm all done. But here we go. We're, we've uh, left off halfway through the 20th century there, roughly. And uh, the one, one thing that I hadn't mentioned, but winds up at this point to start to be a fairly major player, uh, is happening on the other side of the world there, uh, you know, with the Russian Revolution and then the rise of communism. And, and although there's been some interaction and whatnot through the Second World War and the First World War and, and uh, whatnot, for the most part, uh, there wasn't a lot of military interaction between uh, the Soviet Union and, and the West, but uh, there sure would be. Not military, but there'd sure be a lot of activity moving forward. Um, because while we've got here in the West, we had, uh, you know, this, this radically changed financial system and radically changed education system and this new science of psychology that was having a radical impact on advertising, which moved into politics and pretty much every every aspect of, I mean, if you're trying to sell anything to anybody, then uh, psychology is playing a role in that, and whether you're trying to sell a thing or an idea or whatever. And so we had a, a Western society that was pretty comfortable, doing pretty good, but, you know, there was a lot of manipulation going on on a massive scale, a lot of uh, brainwashing, so to speak, a lot of it. Um, and there was a lot of shenanigans happened behind the scenes that uh, we didn't, as the general public, didn't really pay that much attention to because things were pretty good. Um, so now we go back to the Soviet Union and, you know, there's always a saber rattling and threat of nuclear devastation and whatnot. There hadn't really been much of a, a military exchanges between the Soviet Union and the West, but I think... Um, one thing we didn't really clue into in the West was that this was a whole new type of enemy. This was an enemy that humans didn't really deal with in the past. You know, in the past, our enemy was a nation and its culture and whatnot. And it was pretty cut and dried and clear. But with the Soviet Union, it, it, it actually wasn't that. I mean, it looked like that by all uh, appearances. But the reality was the real enemy was the ideas the ideas that uh, of Marxism that grew out of Marxism and those ideas were the real enemy of the West and the West didn't realize that but the leadership in the Soviet Union realized it and they realized that although you know unless they were willing to blow up the entire planet they probably weren't gonna have any kind of military victory but they could certainly destroy Western civilization through these ideas if uh, they were careful and patient enough. And so they began a campaign that, uh, you know, it's kind of started in the 30s with the unions a little bit, but, you know, workers in America were pretty comfortable. So, there were, you know, you couldn't organize, like you could organize them to stomp around and ask for more money, but that was about the extent of it. We were doing pretty good. Not much cause for revolution when you got a nice house, uh, good and a full belly. So they, they weren't very uh, successful there. You know, they started planning some ideas, but they started infiltrating the university education system in the forties and you could look up the Frankfurt School and uh, probably learn quite a bit about that. But these Marxist ideas and the ideas that grew out of them, out of those Marxist ideas, uh, they start to take hold in universities. And uh, at first, you know, it's just a few students and uh, became in a few universities and it became more and more and more. And, and soon there was uh, university professors all around the world who were who were dedicated and committed leftists, Marxists, communists, postmodernists. Uh, these ideas like critical theory grew out of that and critical race theory grew out of that. And, and these ideas 
began to penetrate and and uh, in Western society and more and more people picked up on these ideas that were ultimately really dangerous to a to a healthy society um, but effective as all get out like uh, you could question the ethics of this kind of thinking but can't question the effectiveness this stuff works like if you can just redefine a word uh, to win an argument you're going to win the argument and we you know we see that plain as day here anywhere like if you can call a completely peaceful protest violent all you have to do is redefine the word violent or redefine the word peaceful it's easy and then it's not a peaceful protest anymore and you win and uh, you see it all around now so uh, this is sort of where it, in the middle of the century it started to grow out through the universities and also the Soviets started funding dissent and civil unrest and if there was a protest to be had, you guaranteed that there was the Soviet Union was behind the agitation and the financing and the organization and the education. And uh, they were financing and organizing both sides of every argument. And, and they were organizing protests and counter protests. And, and it was their goal to, to, to break Western society down through culture and politics and economics and they started with culture and they started penetrating and embedding these ideas these left I leftist ideas that are fundamentally rooted in the idea that truth and reality is irrelevant that power is the only relevant thing and and uh, well you know we see it all around us now it's just normal now but it uh, wasn't then. In those days, we, if we sort of hung on to this anchor of truth, and we may argue about what the truth is, but the truth was a thing. And uh, it's just not anymore for a lot of people. And that's, you know, it took 50 years to do that, but they did it. It worked. And uh, you see it all over the place. And I don't even have to bring up any specific issue or or change at all and even though a lot of this dissent brought forth a lot of very positive change in our society it brought forward even more negative changes and subtle ugly little cancers that infected our society and our civil western civilization and well I think you, if you, you don't have to look very hard to see it all around you now um, and uh, you know, and and that was the cultural aspect of this three-pronged war that the Soviets were engaging in, and and uh, money, finance, economics. That was another of their prongs, and uh, it took them a while to figure out exactly how to make it work. But eventually, they did it because, like I said before. Your, uh, the enemy isn't a, a nation state. The uh, the enemy is is ideas, and so once China went through the moves that it made and became a communist country, uh, there, <laughs> there was this brilliant idea developed that that uh, we should take all this Western money and dump it into China. And, it, and they'd become a democratic state because, you know, all this Western money would come in and, and be so beneficial to the Chinese people that they would walk away from communism and embrace democracy. And uh, what a bunch of morons. Like, I don't know who thought it was a good idea to make everything outside of your own country so that, it, you know, if, if you happen to be doing business with an enemy state, well, you have to cooperate or you won't have nothing. They'll just stop sending it to you and then you're done. A bunch of morons came up with that idea. Or the enemy came up with that idea as a way to destroy Western civilization and holy smokes is it ever working. But come the 70s like major changes happened and what you're you know what we're seeing in the 70s was was 
now we have multiple heads of this giant elite snake and they're all sort of battling for control over the rest of us and the world and so you have this Soviet snake head and, and uh, it's sort of moved from the Soviet Union to China but uh, you know kind of didn't make too much of a big deal out of it and once China was starting to get a real foothold financially and there was bazillions of Western dollars in there stirring up their economy then it was then it was okay to close down the Soviet Union and just tear down that wall Mr. Gorbachev um, because it was the ideas we're fighting not the nation and we didn't even know it still at that point but this multi-headed snake now this western head of the snake these western elites they did something really interesting that uh, you don't hear a lot of people talking about too much but I was talking earlier about how the Federal Reserve and whatnot was a an enormous change in the way money worked and uh, and in the well I don't know late 60s or early 70s I don't remember exactly when they did it um, but what happened is they decoupled the dollar from gold now keep in mind the American dollar at this point was sort of the global standard of currency and and because it was tied to the price of gold and and it was a very stable dollar and oil exchanges all over the world were taking place in US dollars and US dollars were pretty much the standard in in international trade at this point and uh, and yeah and then they sort of they even said they were doing it and whatnot I remember it happening and I just didn't understand what it meant uh, I'm not sure I fully understand it now but they decoupled the dollar from gold and uh, what that did is that made the US currency complete fiat currency with no actual tangible asset tied to it at all it was just a a uh, literally a it was virtual money it didn't have any actual tangible value anymore once the gold standard was dropped, money was just a concept. And uh, that's a big change. That's a pretty darn significant change. And, uh, and immediately the effects could be seen with in, you know, inflation and, and uh, just the whole thing just started to spin out of control. And then you add this concept that I'm not exactly sure when it it became a thing, but it's certainly a thing. It's called fractional reserve lending. And when I first started hearing about fractional reserve lending, it made sense. Sure, you can only lend a fraction of what you have on reserve. Like if I have a hundred bucks, I can loan you ten bucks. That's fractional reserve lending, right? No. No, that's not what it is at all. Not the way I understand it now. Now the way I understand it is fractional reserve lending means you have to have a fraction on reserve of what you lend. So, you know, most countries have a 10 to 1 fractional reserve lending uh, ratio. So that means that uh, if you are a bank and you have a billion dollars on reserve, well, damned if you can't loan out $10 billion. Yeah, I know, that doesn't make any sense at all. Like, go back to you and your hundred bucks, and, you know, if you have a hundred bucks, you can loan me ten bucks, no problem. It's, you got a hundred, you can loan me ten. Well, let's, let's employ fractional reserve lending. So, you have a hundred bucks, now loan me a thousand. <laughs> How are you going to do that? You're not, because you're not allowed to do fractional reserve lending. You have to do actual reserve lending. You're gonna loan me a thousand bucks, it's because you have a thousand bucks. 
But those rules of reality don't apply to banks. You see, if a bank has a billion dollars on reserve, they can loan out $10 billion because they can just create $9 billion out of thin air. They hit enter and now there's an extra billion dollars. Just like that. The fact is, there's actually no such thing as money. Money's completely virtual. I've read that anywhere between 3 and 5% of the the money involved in the global economy is actually in any kind of printed form at all. Money is not real. It's not a real thing. If electricity stops working, all the money goes away. If hackers get into the servers where all of these this data is stored, all the money goes away because there's actually no such thing as money. There's no thing you can put in your hand. A $20 bill no longer represents a given amount of gold. It does it it represents whatever it's worth today. It has no actual tangible value. It actually doesn't exist. Yeah. So you know, you can look this stuff all, all up yourself. This is actually this if this information is public. Every, everything I've talked about is, is ready. The information is readily available. You might have to dig around and find it. It's probably not going to be a, a one-click story on your Facebook page. You'll probably have to go digging for the information, but it's there. How do you think I found out about it? And, you know, maybe I've fallen for some silly conspiracy theory thing, but... Most of the information that I read came directly from things like the Federal Reserve, so they're telling you themselves how this works. The fact is, there's really no such thing as money. It's all imaginary. It's all virtual. It's created with a keystroke. And the only way this beast continues to live is by borrowing more money. As long as, as, long as borrowing continues then the economy can continue. And if borrowing stops, the economy collapses. There's no such thing as money. So there you go. That's the, uh, we'll call that the end of part two of the big picture. And leave her at the 60s and 70s.